could connect with all of you so that you might have the opportunity to become part of this larger movement. Uh, and thank you for being here. There's so many things going on and so many places to be as part of TCG. So I'm excited to have uh, familiar faces and unfamiliar faces here. Lots of uh, past, present, and hopefully future collaborators on this initiative. To begin, I want to acknowledge the land on which we stand. Goodman Theater was built on the traditional and unceded homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations. We recognize that many other nations consider the area we now call Chicago as their traditional homeland, including the Miamia, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sac and Fox, Peoria, Kotskotsia, We, Kickapoo, and Moscouton, and it remains home to many Native peoples today. I also want to do another kind of acknowledgement because this month is uh, Gun Violence Awareness Month. It's June. And I want to acknowledge that we are facing a public health crisis. Every year, over 44,000 people die on average to gun violence in America, more than any other comparable nation of our size. According to the CDC, firearms have become the leading cause of death for children and teens in America, more than car accidents, more than cancer. Every day, more than 120 Americans are killed with guns, and we have to acknowledge that some communities are impacted far more than others. Black Americans are 12 times more likely than white Americans to die from gun homicide. 120 a day. So you do the math, that's every 12 minutes someone will die from firearms in this country, meaning at the end of this session, at least seven individuals will have died from gun violence. Those are sobering statistics. Statistics that should be enough to change hearts and change minds because we know that behind every statistic, every number, every headline, every hashtag is a person. It's a community and it's a story. I created enough place and gun violence in 2019 as a way for the theater field, a field full of storytellers to respond to this uniquely American crisis. Our mission is that we call on teams to write short 10 minute plays confronting the issue of gun violence that will spark critical conversations and inspire meaningful action. And if you just join us, there's a few seats here in the, we're trying to keep maybe these three seats open, but uh, for our live streaming friends at home, but there are seats here, um, or uh, feel free to hang out on the perimeters of the room too, but thank you for being here. Now, before we get too far into who we are, why we are, what we do, and how you can be a part of it, uh, we want to know a little bit about why you're here and what you hope to get out of this session. Uh, to insist me with that, I've enlisted the help of a good friend and mentor of mine who is helping us co-lead this session, Mr. Michael Rode. If you don't know Michael Rode, <laughs> There he is, and there he is. If you don't know Michael Rode. There will be pictures of everyone up there. Not yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, he wears many hats. Among them, he is a director of the CoLab for Civic Imagination and has been with Enough from the beginning as a member of our National Advisory Council. As a theater maker, educator, and facilitator, Michael has been working at the intersection of culture, uh, community development, local government, and public health for 30 years. On top of all that, Michael is just good people. He is probably the most conscientious and thoughtful theater artist I know, uh, so I'm very grateful for him to join us uh, today. And I'm gonna hand it over to Michael for this next part. This is, oh, this is just like five minutes or so. This is just like who's here. Um, thanks, Michael. Thanks, TCG. We're really glad to be here because of all the things Michael has said and will say. We're really excited you're here. And we're just really curious uh, how many folks are here, uh, are staff at theater companies or institutions somewhere? How many people work at a theater? Okay. How many people are board members at a theater? Okay. How many people are artists who frequently work at a particular institution? Your hands can go up as many times as you want. <laughs> uh, how many folks are students who are participating in this conference from a, yes, a lot of students, that's so awesome you're here, thank you for being here. Um, can somebody start by telling me, like, why'd you show up at this session? Why are you in this room? There's a lot going on. We're really glad you're here. We're curious, like, what brought you into this room at this moment? Just like the one sentence version. I came here because. 
It's okay if it's just curiosity or somebody dragged you along. It's like, <laughs> but what brought you here? I spent 10 years as a New York City paramedic, and I'm passionate about the effect that gun violence has on our country and not just in the <laughs> yeah. Well, what's another reason that brought someone here? Why are you in the room? Yeah. Uh, I was one of the enough playwrights uh, in 2022, and it changed my life in a lot of ways. Wow. Yes. That's why you're super familiar. Good to see you. Yeah. Uh, why, what's the reason that brought someone here? Yeah. Uh, I organized the largest protest in Minnesota in response to Parkland for high schoolers. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for doing that. What's another reason someone is here? Yeah. I grew up in Chicago, so I understand gun violence very well, and I'm very passionate about how the arts, and I always say like theater, saved me. But like, how can, it, how can those two things combine? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. what's, what's another reason? What's some, yeah. I worked uh, running a theater program at the Cook County Juvenile Detention Center mm -hmm. with the juvenile offenders uh, for eight years. And you know the power of theater in that space, in many spaces. Thanks for being here. Another, another reason someone else is here? Yes. I find that more and more of my students are writing plays about gun violence. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Another reason that you haven't heard? Yeah. Um, I've lost family to gun violence, so I'm trying to see how this theater intersects with my life experience. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for that loss, and thank you for being in the room today. Yeah. Other, other reasons? Yes. Um, engaging very specifically um, with youth, youth arts programming. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Anyone? Anyone else? Any reason that has not been said? No. Wait. Wait. Just lie on here. Uh, I'm a high schooler, and I don't think it's fair that like um, me and kids around me are scared to go to school sometimes mm -hmm. because of gun violence, and that we have that fear. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. I feel like that's a really good place to stop. Somebody who's in a high school experience right now and bringing both fear and possibility into the room. Thank you for being here, and Michael, I'm going to pass back on to you. Thanks for helping us get a sense of like why we're here and sort of who we are in this space. Yep. Why am I here? How did this uh, program start? I get asked that question a lot. And actually, the origins of Enough began in this building at the Goodman. I was in rehearsal for a show uh, as an assistant director, and we were on a break, and an actor looked at their phone, and there was a headline for an active shooting situation at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. This is Joaquin Oliver. Joaquin was one of the 17 individuals shot and killed on that day. And I guess, you know, the room reacted as you expect it would react with a lot of outrage, um, disgust, sense, some sense of hopelessness, you know, sentiments of why does this keep happening again and again and again in our country? And then break was over, and what do we do? We went back to rehearsing a play. And uh, for me, it felt like this is what we kind of do all the time with this issue. We, we, get, we react, and then we go back as if things are somehow normal again. And so I, I sat there thinking, and because I was an assistant director, I had a lot of time to just think and sit. <laughs> um, I sat there thinking, well, what if we did more than react? What if we responded? What if we responded across the field? and? Um, we did it in a unified way, where we leveraged our spaces, our places in the community, and our skills as storytellers. But what would we sort of rally behind? What would be the material? And what came out of Parkland? An incredible youth movement. Mm -hmm. Young people holding us adults accountable. Uh, uh, staging rallies, organizing March for Their Lives, uh, demanding action. Those young voices speaking up to say enough is enough for all those like Joaquin who no longer can speak. So these are the voices that I felt needed to be amplified in this moment, the generation that it's impacting the most. So for me, uh, Parkland was my inciting incident. You know, that thing we talk about in, the play, in a play all the time when things suddenly change and the real action can begin. And I think that pretty much sums up what the goal behind Enough is. We invite communities along with us to bring art, activism, and amplifying youth voices to confront this uniquely American crisis. So I want you to think about the story of our program cycle in three acts. Uh, act one is our call for submissions, act two is our nationwide reading, and act three is the community engagement. 
So Act 1, call for submissions. We put out a call nationwide to teens 13 to 19 years old to write a 10 minute short play confronting the issue of gun violence. And the prompt is as open as that. We don't lead by taking any position beyond there's too much damn gun violence and we should find ways to end it. Uh, we provide students and teachers alike with robust resources, uh, curriculum standards, lesson plans for our teachers, and then for our students, advice from seasoned playwrights and a roadmap to uh, writing your play. And both uh, sets of toolkits are full of nonpartisan, uh, factual, statistical research behind gun violence in this country. And the goal is to ensure success on both ends, whether you're a teacher who wants to implement this in your classroom, or a, teach, a theater educator who wants to do this with your youth ensemble, or if you're a student who just finds out about it on Instagram and wants to submit a play. We uh, host some virtual writing workshops with partners like the Goodman and Dramatist Guild for uh, young people across the country. And then eventually, six writers are selected to be part of that year's cohort. Those six writers are paid a $500 stipend. They're produced as part of a nationwide reading and brought out to the flagship production to witness their plays. They're published in an anthology, and they receive memberships to the Dramatist Guild and further craft training and development of their plays. We treat them like they are, like they are the professional playwrights that they are. Oh, and I forgot one really important point, is that every playwright no matter what level of the selection process they advance to, gets feedback from at least three readers on their play. Because it's in a, in a, in a program that is, the core of it is uh, making sure that teens know that their voices are being heard. We want to make sure that we practice what we preach. So every uh, young playwright gets feedback on their play from three readers. So our call for submissions invites young writers to share their lived experience or practice empathy by imagining the experience of others, express and articulate their point of view by honing their voice, and make sense of this important issue and what's happening in the world around them through practicing the fundamentals of playwriting and theater. So for us, enough is more than just a writing competition, though that's part of it, right? It's the inciting incident that helps young people discover the power and potential of their voice. And I want to pause for a second and just talk about our just banger selection committee <laughs> that we get to do this every year. Um, truly, every year we have what's like an Avengers level <laughs> roster of playwrights <laughs> who will read the 20 semifinalists and end up giving feedback to all those writers. And just imagine you're a 16 year old thinking, am I a playwright? Should I be a playwright? Do I have anything to say? And getting feedback from like Lauren Gunderson or David Henry Wong or Terrell McCraney or Lloyd's, uh, I mean, like, just, uh, it's just amazing and super validating. And then those playwrights who are selected go through a process of workshops, table reads, uh, virtually with actors, and that gets them ready for Act Two, which is our nationwide reading. So we invite uh, organizations of all sizes, whether they're high schools, theaters, community groups, to join us for free on the same day and present that, those plays. Um, the core content is the six plays plus a prologue epilogue, so around 80 to 90 minutes worth of material. And then, just like the writing component, we provide robust toolkits. So for our producers, it's a, it's a guide that has uh, advice on finding community partners to really uh, enhance uh, the impact of your event. Um, it's uh, advice on facilitating those maybe tricky post-show discussions that you'll have. Marketing assets, and then an audience guide that does a deep dive into the themes of each play. Uh, we do virtual partner events to connect partners nationwide to really underscore the coalition aspect of the program. And really, what's important to us is that the whole thing is flexible to meet the capacity that a producer might have. Like, we've had readings that are, you know, we the Goodman reading was in this room. You know, we've had readings in classrooms. We've had readings all the way up to the Kennedy Center and everything in between. Scale does not equal impact, mm -hmm. all right? Intentionality equals impact. Uh, so uh, we really wanna make sure that uh, there is no barrier to entry. We're not saying that you have to be at a certain level to be a part of this project. So our nation reading presents the issue of gun violence to the community through a variety of lenses. Each play always takes a unique point of view. 
challenges a community to think about how the issue of gun violence impacts them specifically, brings youth perspectives and point of view center stage, and creates space for a conversation where there usually isn't one. I mean, literal space, like having those conversations in this theater, for instance, but also when are we usually talking about this issue? After a Parkland, after a Uvalde. No, we pick a day and we say, today we're talking about this because it's important every day. So enough is more than just the performance. It's the inciting incident that galvanizes audience members to become active on this issue. I don't know how often I've heard that at the at folks watching these plays are just primed to be told, what do I do now? And that brings us to Act 3, which is the community engagement. And this is where our mission of sparking critical conversations and inspiring meaningful action really solidify and become tangible. This is where uh, organizations partner with folks who are doing the work in their community on this issue. Uh, some examples of that, there's been conversations with local stakeholders, people inviting their mayors or state representatives, raising money at the local organizations, letter writing campaigns, signing petitions, memorializing local victims of gun violence, even protests and marches, which we will get to in a little bit. Um, it's just truly incredible the way that this unfolds in each community. Can I have one thing? Oh, oh super gosh. quick. Yeah. I just want to say how important this slide is for being at this conference. Because Act 1 and Act 2 make sense for how theaters know how traditionally to operate. And this is outside the box for many, many institutions for many reasons. And something that enough and Michael and our incredible collaborators who are going to speak a little later demonstrate how theater institutions can engage. And I just don't want to let this slide pass without saying this is the sole reason that Michael and all of us are at TCG with this. Because this is not where theaters automatically go, but they can. So thanks. No, no that's, that's great. It's, yeah, it, this is really, this is the end game of this whole project every cycle. Act 3 is the most important. So the community engagement allows organizations to point and engage audience in the direction of immediate, tangible action that they can take, foster meaningful relationships with local organizations, create leadership opportunities for young people, connect the issue in the plays with the issues facing the community. So. Enough is more than a single event, it's the inciting incident for enduring collaborations and partnerships. And there's a bit of an epilogue to this story because now the plays exist in the world. They're published by our partners at Play Scripts. They can be uh, performed and licensed through them and they can be used for future performances, obviously, but classroom and uh, curriculum and instruction Developing training modules, we have uh, some very loose discussions right now with the Metropolitan Police Department in DC about how our plays can be used there. And advocacy as a powerful tool for generating empathy. So enough is more than a script. There are tools for cultivating inciting incidents that shift culture one room at a time. So we've had three calls for submissions in the past four years, three uh, nationwide readings. Uh, we've received 600 short plays by team writers over that time. Uh, 21 of the plays have been published across three volumes. And if you haven't already, there's the copy of our newest volume at the table there. Feel free to take anything on that table with you when you go home. 140 organizations across 41 states have participated in our nationwide reading. And those readings have involved 3,000 artists and reached 14,000 people and raised thousands for local organizations. So that's what enough is. And that's what we've done. And I've, uh, this whole time I've, I've, I've broken a major uh, rule of narrative, which is I'm uh, doing a lot more telling than showing. So uh, let's show you something, all right? Southside Summer by Woo! Chicagoan. Mackenzie Boyd was part of our 2022 lineup. And thanks to the support of our partners here at the Goodman, yeah, come on up, please. Uh, uh, partners here at the Goodman Theater, we are thrilled to be able to present Mackenzie's play to you. So we're going to take a moment to get set for that. This reading was directed by Quinna Barrett and features Adana Reed in the role of Eva and Veronda Carey in the role of Joy. Woo! 
Southside Summer by Mackenzie Boyd. At Rise, a cemetery with flowers next to headstones. Lights up on Joy and Eva dressed for a funeral. I remember my first summer here on the south side of the city. Between the music blaring from the car windows and the police sirens, I was lucky if I could fall asleep, and luckier if I could stay asleep. We grew up in Chicago, never stayed in one place for too long before we landed on the south side. We traveled from the loop to the back of the yards, leaving pieces of ourselves along the way. It was a way to remember where we'd been, where we came from, I loved seeing the different neighborhoods. I enjoyed seeing the city. I remember going downtown on winter break to get lost in the lights shining from buildings on Michigan Ave. Each light felt like a spirit threaded and weaved into a blanket over its people. But the one sense of familiarity was, was how we always found that the only thing higher than the skyscrapers was the rent. <laughs> My brother always thought I was funny when I said that. His name was Emmanuel. Born August 18, 2009. Black boy, skin as dark as coffee beans and burnt tobacco root. His hair, a jungle gem of knots and coconut oil. His knees, scarred and bruised because some time ago he convinced himself his feet would turn into wings that would take him anywhere if he jumped high enough. A year ago, Emmanuel, Eva, and I settled in a white house with missing shingles and a door that never seemed to lock, no matter how hard or how many times we tried. It was cheap and dingy, but Manny's eyes lit up each time we drove past it. Emmanuel loved running around the new house, staring out at the world before him. Every day during the summer, he'd watch the other kids play, occasionally asking me if he could go outside, though he knew I would say no. It's not safe, maybe tomorrow. He probably wanted to test his wings. Running through the house and jumping down the stairs in hopes of reaching the end without grazing the creaky boards, forever attached to the same painful fate of realizing he, unlike most angels, couldn't fly. Well, at least not high enough to grab the clouds or dunk a basketball. He went outside, stalling, his daily chore of taking out the trash, wondering when or how the other boys got their wings, how they learned how to fly. I didn't know the kids in my neighborhood too well. I, I watched them play horse and street till their hands were dirty with sand and gravel. <laughs> when the cars came, they'd always sprint to the sidewalk and pretend the ground was lava. <laughs> but one day, they sat on their porch in silence they really believed it was. The boys were holding back, back tears for a kid they even didn't know. One of them gave me their sneakers. As strange as it sounds, I held those tottering shoes to my chest, craving the heavenly embrace of their budding wings to wrap around me. I sat and watched the other kids on the block from my window run up and down the street playing basketball, lighting fireworks long past any doable holiday, or walking to the corner store for slushies and candies and nachos long past when the streetlights debuted. I wondered, did their minds ever race? Hands, sweat, stomach turn and not themselves? Did they go inside their houses and lock the door and unlock it and relock it again just to make sure it was locked the first time? I've messed with the locks till my hands and, and lips finally stopped quivering, till I knew whether to run as far away from the door as I could or, or to push up against it in hopes of keeping the madness out. I mean a shooting happens on the block over, yet they still smile, laugh, as if the night will never end, enjoying the music blasting from cars down the street, not afraid that they will be caught in the crossfire. Which makes me ask, do I need to be afraid? Does, did Emmanuel need to be afraid? I can't forget that day. Bullets dropping like rain, leaving clouds of smoke to cover us. So we started our game. 
the second gunshot. We ducked down behind the cars, camouflaging ourselves, praying that the lives they claimed wouldn't be ours, and the streets became become no man's land, where there is nothing but blood <coughs> sand that covers our prayer hands. The young kids stayed quiet, believing they were playing hide and seek and tag at the same time. When they heard to run, they dashed, laughing softly to themselves. Some of them cried, being frightened by the noise. But we knew there was no choice but to wait till we were able to rejoice till they were told the game was over. When the minutes unexplainably, unexplainably feel like seconds and days all at the same time, telling a story so purely corrupt that could be told without a spoken word. Manny hid under Mr. Wilson's truck. No one could find him. It was as if his body had become one with the asphalt pressed up against him. The third, I couldn't, I couldn't find him. When the shot seemed like they stopped, I called out his name, and amid the putrid fog that tainted the wisp of air, all trapped in my lungs. Emmanuel! Emmanuel! And before my eyes, a shadow rose from the street, dragged by its host to see the foreseeable doom. It was Emmanuel. He ran, just like I taught him. I don't quite know if he ever did understand the games that he played. Then I saw him, hoping his wings would emerge and, and carry him to that White House. My breath was no longer rhythmic. It came out in standards filled with, with, with the same panic that pulled Emmanuel into the crossfire. Maybe he thought it was time to test his wings. I never got to ask him that. He was scared. He had to be. Yelling and screaming that could be heard from a mile away until another bullet ripped through the blue to challenge the beaming sun and steal the breath and light from all under it. I plugged my ears when I heard them scream. Manny, stop! I could hear footsteps coming near the car as if to mock our fear, as if to frighten us even more. And then he, he was there. Stalking the block like the Grim Reaper with faint static through his radio. He was the bounty hunter in search of black souls to petrify while he laughs in our faces, tears in our eyes. I yelled to him, get down, Manny, get down. Here lies a story from our black youth. For Emmanuel and every other brown-skinned baby put to death, with a gun to his head rather than books in his hands, fingertips against the dashboard rather than a blackboard, being treated like the main attraction when he should be adding fractions, dividing, and subtraction. This country, the black boys going to more funerals than birthdays, they said he was resisting. When he was just insisting that he's just a black man in America, the land of the free. When instead he's been shackled from his neck to his feet, seeing if he can deplete the number of black babies meeting their bittersweet relief, spend more time praying on their knees, making their final pleas, when they should be out there getting their degree. His death was unjustified. Blood dried where they collide on our porch side, where his mama cried and screamed. God! Why? When her baby boy's fate was sealed, and my mom, I can hear her curse herself. Every day she opens that door, a tear would fall from her eyes. Feeling as though she had euthanized, paralyzed, petrified, terrified them. Because now our hearts race, keeping pace to face the unforgiving, unloving, deceptive world that would make her kids cry the same way she did, or worse, fight back the way that she wanted to. They deny and deny his death worldwide without a sliver of repentance. His melanin convicted a premature death sentence, because until they stop, things will never change. 
mistake a playground for a gun range, unleashing a rampage till the courtroom becomes their center stage, where their crocodile tears will keep them from the cage. A historical pattern in this day and age. Read the same old book, but reading the same, same damn page. They need field trips and play dates, not oopsies and AKs. My brother didn't deserve it. He, none of them did. And I raised my voice because you need to understand and listen to please. my demands. Please listen, listen to, to me. me. And he just kept running towards that stupid white house. And I don't know why, or maybe I do, and I just can't accept that this was my fault. It was my fault. I told him to run. I did. Oh, God. I did. I made him believe that he had wings, that they would take him anywhere that he needed to go, that they would protect him. And they just threw him to the ground like he was just, just another, another black boy. Slug life. Like a cancer, the bigger the barrel, the more terminal. The everyday feeling of your mortality walks beside you as you try to hide from the danger, cries, and the lies of life itself. Not knowing if the world's slimy, callous hand will pull you in its embrace and steal you from the world that didn't love you anyway. I remember when he, he said, put, put your, your hands, hands up. up. He said, don't, don't move, move or I'll. No, no, no. He wasn't resisting. Stop resisting. He would never take a stand six feet deep in the land. They didn't even say his name. They called him a casualty. They said our case was Time consuming. Too expensive. How we wouldn't win anyway. Worthless. Manny. My boy. My angel. Come home. I mean, I know he can't, or maybe he can somehow. Maybe he finally grew his wings. <clears throat> My mom cries every day now, staring at that spot in the street where her baby boy bodies lay. I'm jealous that the pavement got to cradle my baby in his dying breaths instead of me. <clears throat> my baby died casualty. A nameless corpse forever damned to stalk heaven, not knowing the name we bless and call out or wave to us on every birthday this world stole from him, not knowing that his name will be trapped within our lungs, aching and constricting when we dare utter Emmanuel. He can't tell us that he loves us too. You know, I wanted to leave his shoes by that broken door. I couldn't get the blood out all the way, but Maybe he would follow the trail we made and find his way home. To me, to us. He'd be able to soar. He'd finally be able to fly. Black boy. Skin as dark as gunpowder. Blood as thick as thin can leave the body. Painfully slow. Black hair mixed with coconut oil, gravel. Shirt stained with a red mess that may never be removed, eyes forever closed. Our black boy, why? And now I see a man downtown, amongst the lights, in his beaming glory, adding a new thread the cult of spirits. Maybe, maybe to shield the others and give them a chance to understand what he wasn't allowed to in his last Chicago summer. Join Eva.
replace the shoes by the headstone next to the floor numbers. Blackout. End of play. Conversations sometimes follow these plays. I want to suggest we give our two beautiful performers. <laughs> we're going we're to come to Mackenzie in a moment and certainly honor and appreciate her some more. But when these plays happen in different settings, um, the conversations follow in different ways. And one of the ways that Michael and sort of the the team working around enough have suggested sometimes is to start exactly like we're about to start right now. We're just taking a couple minutes on this because we want to move on to conversations, but we found it useful to invite an audience to turn to someone next to them and just take two or three minutes and talk about what you are thinking about after hearing, in this case, one play, often multiple plays. Rather than immediately go to a full room conversation, folks are left in very different spaces hearing these pieces. So we want to invite you to just turn to the person next to you in just two minutes or three minutes. Give each other space to sort of say, what's on your mind? Where does that leave you? What are you feeling? What are you thinking about? Right? Because there's the, there's the incredible particular story and emotion, what was just shared with us. And there's all the ways that story and others live in the larger issues that we are all thinking about and trying to address. What are you thinking about right now? So here's two minutes just to turn and chat. And if the numbers are weird, it can be three people, but no more than that. <laughs> something I'm feeling is, but finishing the sentence, not along sort of all the things in this moment. Is this here something I'm thinking about or feeling that I was just talking about? You know, what was coming up in those conversations? If you feel like sharing something. And it's okay if not. Just want to make space for that for a minute. Yeah. 
just two words that came from our discussion, yeah. loud and the weight. Loud and the weight, thank you. Something else, yeah. Yeah, the image of the mother being jealous of the asphalt oh. cradling. Oh. In you and I gasped in that moment yeah. at the same time. Yeah, yeah. that was beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Something else someone is thinking about that came up in that conversation, yeah? We were thinking about the real events and relationships that we have, and just calling to mind those images from very clear. Yeah. The relationship to real events, the relationships we have. Anything else? Yeah? Uh, we talked about how there's there's always more than one victim. How there's always more than one victim. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. Um, when this happens in different spaces, one of the things Michael has sometimes counseled groups to do around the country, and we'll hear our friends maybe talk about this some, is sometimes at this moment there will be people in the audience who are working with local organizations doing this work who will speak about the connection of the plays to the work that they are doing. That is something that will happen here. But the, the goal is often the dialogue and connecting people's lived experience and experience here to what is happening in the world and what people can do about it. But right now, I'm going to take a moment and introduce Mackenzie, who wrote that beautiful book. Yeah. So Mackenzie and I checked in before this, and we there's just two questions that I'm going to ask Mackenzie in the brief time that we have. And the first one is, what brought you to writing this play? Um, this play began with a poem that I had written just from after moving to the city of Chicago myself, I found various pieces of my own life that I wanted to weave into this story. And the actual experiences that I had had, not only from my own mother not wanting me to go outside because it wasn't safe, and me looking out of my window, and seeing all of these children having fun, and wishing that for myself, but then also understanding that it's almost like a double-edged sword. Going ahead and writing this, I wanted to go ahead and bring forth the story of the South Side of Chicago in that it has such a bad rap versus what it actually is. It's acknowledging the actuality, both good and bad. Thanks, Mackenzie. So I, I, wanna, I wanna then ask you, you wrote it, it's beautiful. It's been performed in lots of places. What's the experience been for you as a writer, as a human, as an artist, of seeing the play go out into the world? What has that meant to you, and how has it affected your life? Oh, after a lot of tears, it was a lot of smiles. <laughs> because I know that this is going to reach at least one person that's really going to resonate with the story from wherever they come. I enjoy the intersectionality that theater brings and how these different stories, of, even if you can't relate to everything, of how there's something that brings forward a light into your own story and that you feel hurt. And that's what I really wanted this piece to do and for it to have been out in the world, not just in Chicago, but even seeing it in New York myself. It made me feel really good about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And really want to continue to push for a narrative of social justice through theater. Can you I, I, I have one, oh yeah, we're gonna I have one more small one and then the big applause. <laughs> <laughs> one more small one. Um, I asked Mackenzie if she would like to sit and watch the play from here or if she wanted to watch the audience. And I believe you haven't really had the experience of watching an audience before. So what was it like to sit up here watching this group of humans watch your play? I think from being able to see people watch the play and seeing their reactions real time, there are just some things that you can't fake. There are some things that are very innate and you hear it. And it's a visceral response. Seeing people being able to fully take in the piece and knowing that it's, like I said, reaching somebody. It's a very humbling and a very genuine feeling that I have inside that I'm actually doing good with what I'm doing. So I thank you all for 
being here today. Oh gosh. We, we feel really honored to be in the room hearing you play with you the right time. So thank you. I think you and I are going to go over there and Michael's going to set up the next section. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Chicago South Bend is a community where gun violence is felt frequently and by many. And in the case of one of our guests, which you, you're about to meet, it's an extremely personal issue. Uh, Michael will help us lead this discussion, but I get the pleasure of introducing Aaron Nichols, Executive Director of South Bend Civic Theater, and Loria Perez, Angel Mom and co founder of Connected Be the Chain. So now we move from one of the plays and one of our playwrights to actually a conversation that also feels really important in this room, which is how are theaters activating this movement and this work? And Aaron and Luria have a, a pretty powerful story of a theater organization doing work. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Doing, <laughs> doing work in a community right out of a theater institution, but also in deep partnership. So I was thinking that maybe one way I would invite us to start is by Luria asking us to share what you would like to share around the partnership and the work that you've been doing and how that led you to connect with this theater. Um, well, the partnership was through the community, like, um, in action, and- That's your organization that you started? Um, it's, it's a, that's an organization that I support, that actually supports me. Okay. Um, so they gave me a call and they asked, told me about this project. Is this my time to talk? Yeah. Because okay, I better yeah. just stay to my script. Because <laughs> <laughs> if I don't, then I'll, it, it'll, it, it gets. Yeah, you use, use that if that's the way yeah. you want to start. Yeah. Because um, yeah. as Michael said earlier, uh, enough ain't just a project, it is very personal. So I'll start this way, okay? Thank you. <laughs> My experience with Enough has been such a therapeutic outlet. Enough was introduced to me in 2020. It was during the pandemic. I just lost my second child to gun violence. Yes, I said that correctly, my second child. Um, I lost a child in 2017, along with another one of my sons who survived. From 2017 to 2020, I was strong into advocating against census gun violence. While building an organization that I co-found with another angel mom, together we birthed Connected to Change. With losing a child and having a survivor, I had to choose life. So there I was, reaching out and comforting other angel moms and survivors. I felt the need to be a comforter. These traumatizing individuals needed after experiencing no justice behind my first loss and my survivor's wounds, there were bare minimum of support and comfort for my family and I. 
I decided to be the change I wanted to see. That's just what I did. I was told by Trayvon Martin's mother, Sabrina Fulton, that angel moms stick together and that we strive to turn our pain into purpose. And purpose is what I reach for. Comforting other moms brought comfort to me. Loving on survivors and highlighting love and life, their way comforted me. Not wanting to be bitter, but better was the lead to my healing. I gained over 100 of my children's peers as bonus kids. I am the community mom they call Mama Bird. It was then I knew it was going to take them to help me in order for me to help them. Those children became change agents of Connected Me to Change. We are survivors and each other com com comforters. Just when things were lighting up in my grief journey, I lose another child. And this one hit harder than before. It was in my home and by a child I had sheltered. I thought I would be done with the whole thing, you know, advocating, comforting, believing that we could curb gun violence. But my love for seeing these kids live wouldn't allow it. I had to be I had to begin to I and I'm sorry, I began to lose faith and trust. I'm down to one child. I don't want to risk losing them. So I went to therapy, but that wasn't I wasn't ready for it. I needed something else, you know? Like how do I continue to turn my pain that I turned into purpose that now has to be repurposed? Mm -hmm. Then I received a call from a friend that's a part of Moms the Man Action of Indiana, telling me about Enough and their playwriting on gun violence. I was all ears and soon all in. <laughs> that was the spark I needed. My first round with Michael and his Enough team in my local community theater, South Bend Civic Theater, I gathered some survivors to act out the playwriting as we were sent, as they were sent to us. <coughs> It was, a set, it was a success, even during the, the COVID crisis. As I had picked the actors, I felt this project would be a therapeutic way of these survivors to let out some steam, right? Some plays made us cry, Salt Side Summer, Allegiance, uh, This Early House. Some made us angry, Malcolm, Rehearsal, Rounds. Some felt like our very own violence here. Ghost gun, right their wrongs, no prospering weapons. Each play we done, we related it to some shape or form. I knew enough was just what I needed to help these youth use their voices. Second year, I used survivors and siblings along with a few adults. I even got a chance to act out a couple. <laughs> It was, I act out, it's okay, and salted lemonade. I became a director at that point, best feeling I had in a while. <laughs> <laughs> this third year, the year with the full support of my civic education department, from the South Bend Civic Theater, we networked it, we reached out to four different high schools, community centers, and multiple organizations. And it was the cry out I needed. You see, from day one, and I said it before, enough wasn't just a project, it was always personal to me. Our community showed up and cried. The youth was highlighted and we followed their lead. You could hear them blocks and blocks away, they were just chatting, enough, as they marched to the city county building to pick up our mayor. Mm -hmm. They gave speeches on the mm -hmm. stairs of the county building and delivered six finalist plays on the stage of my second home. The community filled every seat in our 205 seats while even some stand. I can't forget to mention that on that day, November 6th, was my son's Anthony birthday. How much personal can I get for me? What a way to celebrate a life I birthed. Without the unity in the community, these six plays would have been hard. They wouldn't have been heard. So that's what we will continue to do. Connect, call on, be a village, so all our voices are heard. You see these, so you see my tragic losses are just two of others, two of many others. We must pass the torch. There's enough room for us all. 
I didn't just gain purpose back with enough. I found the passion for theater and a, and a family with myself in civic theater. I promise I'm almost done. <laughs> I do believe we can curb senseless gun violence, but we have to work together and acknowledge one another, and most importantly, listen to the youth. So we can help them understand this doesn't have to be the norm. We can learn how to change hearts and mindsets as we continue to bring enough playwright into our community. With that being said, I would like to thank Michael for allowing me this opportunity and trusting in the South Bend Civic Theater to be a part of this national awareness of what I call an epidemic. And I'd like to thank Aaron and the civic, and my civic team for being the most supporting partners I could ever have. journey, but also how that has come into this partnership. Before you talk in detail about the program, can you give folks here a snapshot? I'm being asked to speak up a little louder for our friends at home. So um, a snapshot of your theater, so folks here understand what the organization is that this partnership is sort of based in. Tell us a tiny bit about Sure. Um, we are a civic theater, we're a <coughs> professional theater, we have a staff, um, but I've been in the executive director role for seven years, and when I came, I really felt like we needed to shift to truly be a voice for all of our city. I think too often it's a, a civic theater specifically feels like a nostalgia machine. And I felt the kind of phrase that we use is an engine of empathy was necessary. And I think that's what we've aimed to become. And that's very proactive. Um, telling underrepresented stories, giving the mic to other people, developing with instead of for. Um, and that work led us to the Enough Project. Um, tell us that, tell us how Enough became a part of your body of work and like this partnership. I think we were seeing Enough dealing with gun violence. A lot of gun violence in the first year was school shooting um, and it kind of evolved into including just the epidemic of random, unceasing gun violence within our communities. And I think through Connect to Be the Change, the organization that Laurie was with at the time, um, that partnership seemed so ordained. Like, we needed to tell these stories. I mean, these are hyper-local stories for us. And I think that, that hyper-local element of it has grown and grown to say we love the national story but we have these stories everyone unfortunately has these stories how can we tell those on our stage I yeah. want to ask you a really specific question yeah. there's a lot of people here from theaters yeah and sometimes theaters partner with community organizations yeah. in different ways what did it mean and was it unusual for you in the way you built this particular partnership I felt we had it had to be done correctly um, I think a lot of theaters jump into whatever topic of the moment is and try to produce stories about it, and usually that takes years, if done right. Um, and I felt like we just had this immediacy to the work that you were doing that gave us legitimacy in working together. Um, I, we, we didn't deserve to do it without Lori. So, so that brings me to a different question, which is, Maria, you, it seems, must have put a lot of faith in Aaron in the theater. So what was it that made you feel you could trust this kind of gentleman and the organization? Because, you know, not every organization is trustworthy for the kind of work you're doing. What made you feel like you could step into that? They listened. The first year when we did the play, you know, I brought all survivors in. Everyone has been affected. They survived a gunshot wound. And we were reading these plays, and they got a little theoretic with us. Like, you're supposed to do it this way. I want you to express it this way. And I'm like, hold on. 
I'm like, she is reliving something. She doesn't want to cry. She's angry right now. Allow her to be angry. So then they were like, cut. Try angry, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so um, it, just allowing us to use the the emotions that we were feeling, mm -hmm. and, and and we had to go off the paper. You know, the what the paper says is, well, we're survivors. Mm -hmm. We're saying this. We're mm -hmm. feeling this, and they tried it, and that right there made me know. I was like, you know what? I can say something. They'll listen to me out, and then I was learning too. I knew nothing about theater, <laughs> so the first year was just new to me. But I knew that I had. Those, these kids trusted me. So I had to trust their feelings, you know, protect that. But the empathy and the compassion that the theater had allowed me to just release a little bit, learn something, and allow them to learn something as we were wrong with it. I mean, it's a huge, huge lesson that Lurita just shared with us in terms of how organizations work with folks who don't have the same expertise yeah. in our field and yet have an expertise that is as important, lived experience. Mm -hmm. So that dynamic, that interchange, that could go wrong in 35,000 different ways. Mm -hmm. And you're expressing like the listening, the compassion, the empathy, and the respect. We need to hear that. Like We all need to hear that in our field in terms of the potential of these partnerships. So thank you for like being that specific about it. How did it proceed from there? Well, she's our guest services manager now, so that's awesome. <laughs> That's part of it. It's, we get it right from the door. Right. <laughs> but I think that's true. I think it's bringing, bringing that expertise in, bringing that trust in, and saying, we believe in you and the stories that you have to tell and the stories you're yet to engender from our community. So it's it's been a beautiful process. I think the cool thing that's happened in heard it briefly was that our education program, this isn't just a one-off, now our education program is getting involved. And even though there's not an official enough thing in 2024, we're still working on our hyper-local stories, mm -hmm. still bringing our kids together to write the plays. Yes. Um, you know, still working with government, still working with community organizations. We did a march, which for an executive director is a weird thing to do. Um, <laughs> but I was like, of course, we're yes, we're going to do a march. You know, because because Lori, Lori to wants to do a march. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and and it went off without a hitch. I mean, it was it was beautiful. The mayor came out and talked to us and said, thank you. So any kind of weird political kind of concerns you may have, because it's real. That, that's a weird polarized time. But you can't say that we don't have, that, that, that enough is enough. You have to say that enough is enough. We have had too much gun violence. And I think the community does come together around that because it is truly just, there's too much gun violence. What can we do? How can we move forward, give space for these stories, and then do our best to help these kids? And I think the kids part is important too. Because these are being written by teens, again, it strips a little of the baggage away from it and gets to the heart of the experience, whether it's the trauma or the survival or whatever it is, because these are the voices of our kids. And if you can't understand the importance of the voices of our next generation, then get out of the way. <laughs> and, and theaters need to stand up and say enough. And you have the right to do that as theaters, even if you get NEA funding, or even if you have whatever political nervousness about that. You can do this, you should do this. It is our job as theater storytellers to tell these stories right now, because I hope in the future we'll look back and see that the, these are the upswells that changed an epidemic. And we have to be there. Theater artists, from the beginning of theater itself, we're holding mirrors up to society, and we have to do that on this issue. And Michael has given us, you have given us the foundation to build upon to hopefully really make a difference through this powerful and beautiful art form that we all celebrate. To, to, I to yeah, to give I purpose, to, to give voice, to, to turn trauma into triumph. And enough is not enough until we have enough people yeah. that is in on it and we are actually changing minds and hearts and we're not going to funerals, but we're going to family reunions and gatherings and more 
joyful theater. Yeah, and I, you know? I, I, I want to I want to say something. We've we've learned we've learned something in a couple of years. We're we're doing the entire August Wilson cycle over ten years, and I love it. It's beautiful work, but enough August Wilson. A lot of this stuff is trauma drama. It is. <laughs> And I'm telling you to primarily white theaters, if that is all the stories you tell, mm -hmm. you're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, if you get involved in this, you've got to tell black joy stories. Mm -hmm. You've got to tell BIPOC power stories. And not just leave it traumatic, because if it's just traumatic, you're just reinforcing stereotypes and, and the prevailing narratives. You have to do more. I'm going to use that as a moment. First, I want to thank Rhea and Aaron for sharing about what's happening. This thank you and we're going to shift back so Michael can talk about some next steps, I believe. Yeah? Well, we've got a little bit of time left for a Q&A from anyone Beautiful. from the audience. Let's do that. Over so let's stay here. Let's stay here. Great. Shift Mackenzie over. All right. So <laughs> let's, let's turn out to the room here. And you've heard Michael talk about the project. You've heard a play. And you've heard Mackenzie talk a little bit about what that's meant to her. We've obviously just talked about the beautiful work in South Bend with Maria and Aaron. What is on your mind? Is there a question you would like to ask someone up here about the work? Yes, Veronica. I just wanted to make something like just. Aaron? Aaron. Yep. There's something like something. <laughs> 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 Aaron, something you just said to uh, Mackenzie's work. Um, I think that there's a Yes, I see a question right here. I'm going to use the mic. Yeah, for folks who are live streaming at home, I'm just going to pass around the mic. Oh. I'd like to pass the mic. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for your time. Um, uh, it's a two part question. You it, see, do you almost always partner theaters with school districts? And if you partner with school districts, have you found in areas that are primarily white that you've had any school district backlash? Mm. Great question. So uh, most of the partnerships, I would say 99% of the partnerships are driven by the producers. So you know, we put out the call, we send out a lot of grassroots emailing to get people involved, but the actual partnerships between you know, everything that Southside Civic Theater and Connect Be The Change have built, they've built. So we, uh, we aren't in sort of the matchmaking space. But I do know that like one of the places where it gets tricky is when we are doing, um, you know, the, the plays run the gamut of different lenses. So we're talking about school shootings and we're talking about um, uh, community violence in, in, in a primarily black neighborhood. So when you get to a primarily white school district, it can just be hard to do 
do all the plays, and we don't allow allowances. So basically what we say is, um, we need you to do all six plays, because all six plays are in conversation with each other, and it's important that you're experiencing stories that aren't of your own. Um, what that has meant for some schools is that they've partnered with other schools. And they've, and they've split, you know, they've split up the casting and, and producing responsibilities and made it happen. That's primarily where it gets, uh, on my end as a producer, where it gets tricky because we get a lot of folks being like, ah, I can't do, I can't do this play. And I'm like, I think we can figure out a way. The, the, the backup is that we've actually in the past also filmed those plays and made them available so that there really is like no out into not doing it. That's, that's been the biggest sort of like hang up on our end. There was a question, oh yeah. Thank you, um, I was really interested, uh, I think specifically in um, the recruitment of young people and the outreach, um, as well as the, how do you retain them, right? Because um, I think um, with having McKinsey here, and I know there's some other folks in the audience who've done the program, um, what does it look like? Because um, I know even in academic theater and educational theater, um, there are barriers of access, uh, right? So how do you go about getting teams involved who may not have um, experience in theater, who may not have theater in their school districts or in their, or in their neighborhoods? Um, and then what does the mentorship look like and the advocacy look like once they're in the program and how do you get them to, to sit around? Love you. You love me. You love me. I'll answer that question on my end and then maybe hand it over because of the amazing work you're doing. So um, on my end of things, it, it really ends up being, again, a lot of grassroots, just like I have emailed every theater in TCG all three years <laughs> to try to get them to get this uh, uh, get this out there. Um, and really uh, at, uh, leaning on them and the relationships they have with the schools that they work with or the teen councils or teen programs that they have. Um, but then all of that really important work is done by our producing partners. So I, Aaron and Maria may be talking about, especially since you are generating plays in sort of our off season, how that has happened. Because that certainly has been a development over three years of program. Well, um, step past the torch. So, like, um, Connected Youth Change is not the only organization that works along uh, gun violence. So, I reached out to other organizations. They work with other, you know, peers and things like that. That's a good option to do um, because it, it takes a village to do this type of message. This is a call of action. It's not just therapy. You got to take it as a call of action. Um, reaching out to angel moms and angel dads. Uh, that will very much cradle this as their baby, and they will find you. You see how I call survivors. They will find that outlet that we need. It will be the story that we need, um, and the support. But not only that, just with the theater, um, find your community theater. A community theater would just be your space, but reaching out to other schools would give us a, the ground to go to where we can all meet in one, you know, in one spot. We can have all the rehearsals in the theater versus eight different or six different schools trying to do a play. We just, you know, we have six plays, six schools, but we all have headquarters at a local theater or some community that holds an audience, you know? I would just say find Aloria. <laughs> I mean, she, she has been uh, essential. And I don't think we could have done it without your belief in us. And frankly, your unearned trust in us I think we have earned that, but I think in the beginning, hopefully you've been doing work before this, you know, if you're really talking about a theater, because trust is so important, especially in marginalized communities. Um, is it fair to say if you haven't, you can start? You can, oh, absolutely you start, 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 absolutely start. Yeah. But, but listen, you know, to, to Lori's first point, listen, don't try to teach. I mean, there's ways that your skill sets, your toolbox, will be helpful to help these kids get where they need to go. Um, but don't start with Stanislavski. <laughs> you know, I mean, just let it, let it grow. <laughs> um, and I think 
to, to your question about how do you do it in school districts and whatever, I think there's enough variety in the, in the enough catalog every year even that if you have each partner do one of them, you'll just be smart about which one you give to each partner. And that has worked really well for us. And that engagement and that coming together then is so powerful because you see kids on, no matter what, are encountering stories and experiences that they never would have in whatever bubble that they're in. So enough has been great in that sense as well. Question in the back here, yeah. creating stories that promote black joy, promote black praise. I wanted to know how you guys are um, doing that now, or if you guys plan on doing that, like creating, having more plays about the, the, the black joy, black happiness, things like that. And if you guys are not doing that right now, how would you recommend people reach out, um, the performers, the, the people that want to make these types of plays, how would you say they should reach out to these plays, um, say, hey, I have this like really good story, like anything like that? You know, I, it's, it's such a hard question, because I think it, it, at the core of what this project is, is, is to tell these stories about loss, not just, um, not just uh, from the black experience, but across the gamut. So, you know, in this particular, and I'll have Aaron because you brought that up. Um, but you know, in this particular project, you know, we're really focusing on a really narrow aperture in a way. Um, and I'm glad that Aaron brought that up. It's like this is this can be this is part of the kind of programming that could be done, but not the whole of the programming. That the um, that one way of um, of addressing the severity of this issue is not always by looking at it directly, which is what our program does, but in the additional kind of programming that you can surround around doing enough um, inside of your own season or your rest of what you do with your young people. So Aaron, if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's part of it. It's funny, like in the last couple of weeks I've been thinking about the word enough, mm -hmm. um, or metaphysically or whatever, but enough is, enough is enough, but there's also we are enough mm -hmm. to, tackle this, right? And that's some maybe some of the joy, is just acknowledging the strength in ourselves. And how do we bind together? How do we create collective action or whatever to be enough to to save this to the to the community? But I, I, I also just, I just want to jump in and maybe, I don't want to put Mackenzie on the spot as someone who's written a play big project, but I want to make sure we're not the only voices answering that question. <laughs> you know, being a young black playwright and trying my best to get my own work out there, I think what the communities and theaters to best do to really uplift these black joy stories and black pop joy stories is to take a chance on that person that this is their first play that they're having produced. Go ahead and take a chance on a person that does not have a lot of experience in this to go ahead and be their foundation. A lot of times we'll see different theaters or we'll see different spaces that may go for the, and this is no shade, but it is what it is. They'll go for the Margot Robbie or the Ryan Gosling. Why not take a chance on somebody that isn't that well known? The biggest thing we can do is uplift the voices that people are too afraid to take a chance on. Take that chance. Be courageous enough to take that chance. I think that's what all theater industries need to go ahead and do, not just in playwriting, but in screenwriting, in any sort of field where we can go ahead and have these different opportunities and these different voices. Take a chance on those who aren't that well known and be that foundation, be their, be their rock. It's how we grow. 
Mm-hmm. The good thing else is going to end it with enough is a call for action. We cannot make this a choice story. It is what it is. I would probably cry if enough went on a chart. If on a more, you know, we're happy. Don't mind us, it's not a happy moment. So if we don't, and for angel moms like me, we have to talk about this. Otherwise, my sons, their loss is just what behind a bullet. Like I, I, I raised them to be kings, and the streets and the gun took them. So let enough be the uh, the voice that like myself need to hear, and then let's encourage these actors who did enough to do other plays and be part of a theater that way. When we need more enough cast members, we can call them up. I just want to, I want to say, come back to your to your question in the back, which feels like such an important question. Um, and I'll be another white man attempting to respond to that <laughs> question. And then I'm going to pass you the microphone. Um, I feel like we sort of forked a little bit, and we were having two conversations at the same time, a conversation about how enough lives and a conversation about black joy in theater institutions. And I think your answer, Mackenzie, was really powerful in terms of we need to give voices an opportunity that have not necessarily been produced a lot to bring the diverse stories into theaters uh, and not wait until they've got some track record. So you're bringing lots of voices and stories in. I just want to make sure that that fork that we opened up <laughs> is like put in relation to each other. Yeah, yeah and I, so I, I have been a part of enough readings. I was a part of the It's a Fine True 2023 that you showed, uh, the image there. I was in No Prospering Weapons. And a part of, but I, I want to say that a part of the conversation after like navigating the grief of the, of the gun violence of the loss is how do we dream forward and how do we dream a world that's beyond that as well. And that was a part of the conversation too. And thinking about, yeah, like it's not only about I also have very many um, young black men. I've gone to, I'm from Louisiana and I also live in Oakland. So I, I've, 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 been, I've gone to my share of funerals um, and buried many black bodies. Um, but also thinking about what is the joy and also your piece, Mackenzie, I really want to thank you because you also are presenting us with the Afrofuturist imagery as well around the black body with wings flying. And, and, and black bodies in flight, which is a moment of joy too, a moment of memory. So I think within that pain, in that trauma, yes, it's sadness, yes, we're weeping, but we're also finding images of, of, of healing and joy within that. So I, I, I wanna like stray away from the idea that black joy doesn't live in, the, in black harm as well, because we still, we go to our cookouts, we go to our, and we have our community and we find our people even when we're like navigating the weeping and the, and the grief. So I just want us to remember that firstly. And secondly, to the white, uh, primarily white theater companies, uh, diversify your literary committee. Uh, put folks like, uh, uh, like, put like young black voices on your literary committee, because they know what's going on. They know who Issa Rae is, and you probably don't. So figure it out, my friends. That's all I gotta say about that. Well, I, I want to spend all day here <laughs> with you all. Um, but we're nearing the end of our session, and I just want to end with a call to action. And I want to invite you all to join folks like South Bend Civic Theater, like Connected Change, and dozens of other organizations to be a part of Enough and bring this to your community. I'm going to offer you a few really quick ways to do that. 2025 is our next full program. Uh, cycle. We will do calls for submissions from January 1st to April 1st. October 6th will be our next nationwide reading. Um, easiest way to keep in touch with me is there's a sign up sheet at the back there or you grab my card. Also grab one of those scripts so you can take a look at some of the other amazing plays we've done. Um, but we'd love to see voices from your community. Um, the, the work that South Bend is doing is, you know, by the hand of these two individuals and many other individuals making sure that their community is part of this larger national conversation. So I hope you um, are able to take their lead on that. But also, we've got 21 just amazing plays just like Mackenzie's that you can um, 
get a uh, license through Broadway licensing, through Play Scripts, and put together your own event. Um, we've got an event coming up, uh, a group of DC theater, uh, theaters have an event coming up. They're performing three of our plays at an event for the DC Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. So what I'm saying is, don't just think about like your theater. Think about what civic spaces can you bring these plays to. Um, if you want to talk about that, reach out to Michael, and we will host conversations about how to help you think about that. Exactly. And thanks to our partners at Play Scripts, that there's a bookmark there with links to the volumes, all three volumes. You can read all three volumes in their entirety through the end of this month. So I encourage that you uh, take a look at them. Can I ask you about producing? Um, do you have to produce? A full slate. You uh, said that there was so many produced three. Yeah, so great. We're, we're also working with them of producing across the three volumes, so we can help you curate what that evening or event of theater wants to be. The October sixth event with theaters around the country is meant to be all six, correct? Uh, oh yeah, yeah that but throughout the year, people can select yeah. based on uses. That's correct. Yeah. And really, that's three easy ways to get involved. Encourage play submissions in your community. Join us for the Nation on Reading using South Bend Civic Theater and Connect Via Change as a model for what kind of potential it brings your community. And create ways for people to encounter these plays outside of your theater space and in the community. Um, I know we need to wrap up. I just want to thank really quick Michael Rode, Mackenzie Boyd, Gloria Perez, Aaron Nicholas. <laughs>